Good morning. <laughs> How are you? Who had a good week? Am I more like a Sunday school teacher than a preacher? <laughs> so um, the way I preach, for any of you who have sat under my, my teaching or my preaching before, is, is um, I, I'm not like a subject preacher. Like I don't pick a specific topic, do research, and then try to get something to work. Um, I'm very much a, I need a download from God. Um, he knows I'm really capable of doing the opposite, but I specifically choose to wait and hear from him on any kind of message that he gives me. So I just want you guys to know that up front, that whatever I speak today, it's stuff that I've been praying through and receiving from the Lord. And so here, I'll submit that to you guys. So, um, we're going to talk about bringing hope today. I know there's times when maybe you're going through something and you don't even have a whole lot of hope yourself. You're just not feeling good. You're feeling down. You're feeling discouraged. Um, and that may come and go, right? But I just, I just want to talk to us about receiving hope for ourselves and bringing hope to the world around us. First, I just I want to emphasize, it's really important to me, um, that each, each person has a purpose. God created each of us with a purpose and a destiny, and you have to know that. You need to know that about yourself, that you have a purpose. You have a destiny. You are a world changer, okay? God creates all of us with a purpose and a destiny. And when we receive the Lord and we follow him, Christ in us makes us a world changer. We have the ability to change the world around us. Christianity is not restricted to acts of kindness. It's not restricted. I didn't say it doesn't include. I said it's not restricted to acts of kindness that can be accomplished through my own human capacity. Christianity's roots are based on powerful acts of God through people that cannot be accomplished without him. That is true Christianity, and that is what he has called you to do. He's called me to do. So I just want to share, you guys, share with you guys a testimony about, um, a simple testimony about a friend of ours from decades ago um, who knew us before Christ and um, knew my husband before Christ and just was shocked and blown away by the fact that he's a preacher now. <laughs> So if that tells you anything just about, you know, what he transitioned from decades ago to where, where, what God has him doing now, it shocks the people that knew him two and three decades ago, okay? So our friend, he, um, he lives up north a little ways, and we had some properties up there. We used to be into the real estate business, and we had some properties up there, and we decided we wanted to have children. So we decided we needed to sell those properties because we didn't just need another thing on our plate. And our friend happens to be a realtor, so we reached out to him and connected with him. Um, and he sold the properties for us, but he had to bring the papers down to Madison to sign for us. He didn't make us come up there to the closing. And we just... He took us out to lunch. We signed the paperwork, and um, he didn't really say anything about family or anything, just that his kids were sick. And, and um, when he left, my husband and I both decided um, we just really felt like we needed to pray a blessing over him. So we did. Didn't get any what we felt like profound words of knowledge or anything. We just blessed him, and we felt like there were certain areas we needed to bless in his life including his marriage and his children. And we prayed for, for healing for his children. And he left that day and came back to us later with this testimony. In that almost two-hour drive, he could do nothing but think about what we prayed over him and how shocked he was and how, how it touched every area of life that he was struggling in, that he and his wife were about to get a divorce that his children were very sick and having health issues and things. And just a lot of stuff going on in his life that we had no idea about. 
And he came back to us a few months later with a testimony. He went home. He prayed with his wife. They rededicated their life to the Lord. They found a church. They found a good church to go to that was spirit-filled. And they contacted us three months later and said, thank you. You have no idea. And all we did was pray a blessing. And that brought hope that restored a marriage to this couple. Isn't that amazing how powerful that can be? So I want you to understand that there's, there's two kinds of hope. There's worldly hope and there's kingdom hope. Worldly hope is nothing more than wishful thinking. It comes from a place of uncertainty. Like, oh, well, I hope. I hope your kids get better. I hope, you know, I get into that college. I hope whatever the, the, the case is. It comes from a place of uncertainty. It's not, there's no stability in that. So when we bring humanistic encouragement, it's natural. It comes from a place of sympathy and has no sustaining power. So if people have worldly hope, it's not the same thing as kingdom hope. It's just wishful thinking. And if we try to encourage them in a very in a humanistic way, it's really out of a place of uncertainty. It, there, there's no sustaining power. I want to encourage you. So, you know, I hope my kids get better. And I say something like, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Well, your family's strong and you got great kids, so I'm sure they'll be good. You know, that's kind of really... And it's not a bad thing to say, right? I mean, it's good, it's positive, but there's no sustaining power in that. We're looking for sustaining power. That can only come from God, okay? If we want to give someone kingdom hope, hope that sustains them in the midst of a storm. My husband was talking about storms last week. Well, people around us, they need hope. They need hope. They may look they may look great on the outside, but, you know, and sometimes they may be doing really well, but, but everybody, including us, we go through things, and we need stability. We need hope. We need the sustaining power of God in our lives for that joy and that peace. Kingdom hope is based on what we know is truth from the Word of God. Kingdom encouragement, so we're talking about hope and encouraging. Kingdom hope is based on what we know is truth from the word of God. It's founded in his written word, and it's reiterated by the Holy Spirit in us confirming that word. Kingdom encouragement is supernatural. It comes through love and compassion operating in our lives, and that's what has the the power and the ability to sustain people, to sustain me, to sustain you, to sustain people around us that don't even know the Lord yet. And when they get that, wow, that's when they know, oh my, you've got something I need. We really are the hope of the world. We really are. We carry the hope. We carry the hope of God. We are the hope of the world. In Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Romans 15.4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. So you see, Christ in us, Christ in us is the hope, the hope of glory, the hope of everything God means for us. Christ in us is the hope for those of us who believe, for those of us who are, have Jesus, right? Christ is our hope, and he lives inside of us. Hope comes through scripture. It's, it specifically says in Romans 15, 4, they were written that, through, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. We can get hope from scripture. I need hope. 
I can go to the word of God and just start reading or even ask him where to start. And if I'm afraid I don't hear from God, I can just start somewhere, right? Start somewhere, okay? Hope comes from the word of God because it's true and it's solid. And if you believe that, you have all that you need to stand strong in a storm. And you have all that you need to even command that storm to be still. We receive that, and then we have the ability and the opportunity. God has given us and called us to that opportunity to bring that hope into the people and the lives around us. You know, our friends here at church, you know, when, when I'm having a problem, when you're having it, when we're struggling with something, like even when my dad passed, my gosh, I had lots of hope, but I still needed encouragement. I still needed, I still needed to mourn. I still needed the support of my friends and my loved ones, right? So we have an awesome opportunity to bring hope that sustains to the world around us. They don't have it. You need to understand this when you're walking around. Even believers in us, in the world around us, even believers, whether they're a believer or whether they haven't heard the gospel, because I believe, I truly believe if, if somebody hears the true gospel, they cannot. Why would they say no? If they've heard the gospel and they've received the Lord, they still not, might not be walking in hope. So we need to know that when we're, when we're around people outside of these four walls, we have opportunity to bring hope that they don't even know how to get probably, right? Because it comes from the word of God. It comes through the love of God. It comes from our relationship with him. And, but he lets us bring it to other people who don't even know him or maybe know him, but they don't, like they haven't had this revelation. They're not walking in the renewal of their mind to the point that they understand, the point that they can walk in that hope. And then there's bringing hope to each other here in the body, right? So I just want to <clears throat> pull out a couple stories from Scripture about how Jesus um, instilled hope because people have faith. If you come to me and you say, will you pray for me? I have this thing, you know, I need healing in my body or, or whatever the case is, in my mind. I have this thing. Will you pray for me? That's faith. Somebody's not, you're not going to come to someone and say, will you pray for me and not think that something could actually happen? You believe, okay, if I ask this person to pray for me, that's faith. You have enough faith as a mustard seed. You have enough faith to step out and do something. You have faith. So I want to talk about Jairus's daughter. So those of you who've read this story kind of know how it goes. There's this um, man named Jairus. Um, he is his daughter. He's, she's very sick, and, and you can't imagine how hard that is, how heartbreaking that is. Um, I'm sure you can, if, especially if you're a parent, how heartbreaking that is that his daughter was so sick to the point of death. So he went and he found Jesus. Why? Because he had faith. He believed that Jesus could do something. He went out and he found Jesus and said, my daughter is very sick. Can you please come and pray for her? Of course, Jesus was like, absolutely. This man obviously believes his faith. He believes. So absolutely, I'll come pray for her. And he delayed a little bit. Um, but then one of his servants comes and says, hey, um, your daughter's dead. Don't, don't bother the teacher anymore. So I just throw, yeah. Get those scriptures up there. Um, this is out of Luke chapter 8, verses 49 through 56. And I'm not going to read all the scripture. I'm just going to tell you the story a little bit. And then Jesus gets to the house. And what does he find? <laughs> what does he find? It says, when Jesus heard it, that, that the daughter was dead, he answered him saying, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John. 
and the father and mother of the girl. So we have Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl permitted to go in. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. So they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. So what did he do? <laughs> he kicked a bunch of people out. All of the mourners who were like, No way, she's dead. She's dead. He said, No, leave, leave now, go. Why do you think he did that? Why do you think he did that? He's removing. He was removing. He was removing something from the room, wasn't he? Something spiritual, something that maybe was not tangible. He was removing maybe doubt, unbelief, some things like that. He was getting them away from the mo mom and the dad because, no, no, this mom and this dad, they need hope right now, not your not your negativity, not your, you may be stating a fact, but it's not the truth, right? You may be stating a fact, but it's not the truth. Let's remove your factual negativity from the room. And now, now, now I'm going to speak life, right? And now, then her spirit returned and she arose immediately and he commanded that she be given something to eat. So he removed something from that room in the spirit, in the presence. And so, and he only allowed Peter, James, John, and then the mom and the dad. Don't be afraid, only believe. That's not an easy thing to do in the moment when you're the person going through that. When you're the person that has a sick child when you're the person that has paralysis from the waist down, <laughs> that's not very easy to do by yourself. So God has called us to be the speakers of life in those situations, to come to one another and speak life, encouragement, and hope, to remove that negativity from the room, no matter how true it is, doesn't matter if it's a fact. doesn't matter if the diagnosis is real. That doesn't matter. What matters is what God can do, what he's already done through the cross. That's what matters. So real quick, one more story <clears throat> from Mark chapter 9, 17 through 29. Again, I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but this is about, well, so the, this story happened. Do you remember the transfiguration? Jesus goes up on the mount with Peter, James, and John. Yeah. And all of a sudden, bright lights. And he sees Moses and Elijah, and he's talking to them. And Peter, James, and John are like, oh, my God. Right? Can I build you a tabernacle? Because, yeah. And just like, wow, wow, scary, amazing moment, right? Faith building, right? It had to be faith building to see something like that. And then Jesus comes down from the mountain, and what's going on? There's a man whose poor son has horrible seizures. And the disciples, he asked the disciples, he came in faith and he said, he asked the disciples to pray for them. And believe me, I mean, by now they had already prayed and seen all sorts of healings, miracles, demons casted out. Okay. So th they'd already seen all of that. And now they're faced with this and nothing happens. Don't you hate that when you pray? And you feel like nothing happened. So Jesus comes down and what does the man say? He looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, okay, so Jesus engages him first. Okay, so this seizure has just happened. Okay, and so the first thing Jesus does is he kind of, I think maybe was just trying to settle the situation a little bit. So he just starts asking questions. How long has this been happening? To your son. And so the man just stops and kind of gets his self together and thoughts together and says, well, yeah, it's been happening since he was a boy and, and this happens and that happens. And so he's taking him out of the moment, right? Kind of, we're kind of being distracted from the fact that this boy just had a horrible seizure. 
which is a really scary thing if you've ever seen someone do that. I have. I have, and it's really, really, really scary. It's really scary um, to watch that. So the man says from childhood, and often he's been thrown into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So this man went from a place of faith, a place of bringing him to the disciples, pray for my son, to almost discouragement because the disciples prayed. They've seen lots of healings and miracles already, but nothing's happened when they pray for my son. Ah, that's discouraging. So Jesus says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Isn't that a strange thing to say? I believe, help my unbelief. What does that tell you really quickly? that this man is acknowledging he had belief and unbelief at the same time. He had a measure of belief, but there was unbelief inside of him too. And when Jesus showed him that, he acknowledged it immediately and gave it up and said, help me. So from there in the story, Jesus doesn't hesitate, obviously. He just prays for the son. The seizure stopped. The demon's gone. He's healed. Um, he actually fell over as dead, the scripture says. And everyone thought, oh, Jesus prayed and the, guy, the kid died. No, he, he gave him his hand, raised him up. If Jesus had stopped there, who knows? But he gave him his hand and raised him up. The boy came up and he was fine. The boy was healed. So... My thing here is we really need to bring hope to the people around us and to each other. And if you want to bring hope around you, you have to have hope. So these last couple minutes, I'm just going to talk about what we can do to carry hope. How do we carry hope and give it away? First, got to chase out unbelief. So we saw the unbelief in both stories. We saw. We saw there was something there that shouldn't be there. There was that negativity from, from other people in one case. In another case, it was the unbelief in the man, in the father. You also need to partner with the Holy Spirit to bring supernatural encouragement. I cannot bring kingdom encouragement on my own. It's the spirit of the living God inside of me that brings that encouragement that people need, that sustains that hope that will sustain someone in the midst of whatever they're going through. So how do I chase out unbelief? That was my question. How do I chase out unbelief? You focus on God. Roger talked about that last week, focusing on Jesus. Peter was walking on the water, and when did he start to sink? When he looked away from Jesus and he saw the natural stuff going on around him, that storm rocked him with fear. It rocked him. So how do we chase that unbelief? I'm just going to give you some suggestions here about how to do that and, and read you some scriptures about why, why we want to do that. We want to inundate our life with activities that bring our focus back to the Lord because it is so easy in today's world to get distracted. It is so easy for me to get really distracted with, I have my time with the Lord in the morning, it's wonderful, and then I move into my work day, and all of a sudden I'm just working, 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 working. You know, and, and I know God, and I love God, and God is on my mind, but I'm not focused necessarily on God. And then I get off work, and then I'm taking care of my kids, and then they're throwing a fit, and all these things are happening, right? So it's important to actually have a plan. Like, I need some stuff in my back pocket that I can do on a daily basis to bring my focus back to the Lord. So I'm going to give you some. We want to bring our focus back to the Lord, to his goodness and his truth, because it glorifies God. It acknowledges him and his goodness, that he is bigger. It acknowledges it. It glorifies it. It puts him over and above everything else and says he is bigger. 
He's bigger. What we don't want to do, I'll start with this because I don't want to end with this. What we don't want to do is focus on our natural circumstances like Peter and look around and be like, (laughs) we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that because that glorifies not God, the devil. That glorif- that does not glorify God. That glorifies the, the devil when we when we focus. That doesn't mean I that doesn't mean I don't acknowledge natural circumstances. It doesn't mean that I don't acknowledge something happened. I don't deny. I don't deny something happened. I don't deny a fact, but I don't focus on it. I'm not going to put my focus on the diagnosis. I'm not going to put my focus on a bunch of negative news coming through the media. I'm not going to focus on something I'm struggling with. I'll acknowledge maybe I have a struggle. I I was with my dad, you know, I was mourning. I was I was okay with that. I was okay with mourning. I acknowledged it. And then I focused on God and I worshiped and I let him heal me and carry me through the mourning. I don't focus on the chaos around me. I don't focus on Peter in the storm and, and all of the Oh, you know, the tornado coming or, the, you know, if you're, if you're on a ship, the, the waves that are crashing against the ship, it's easy to be fearful of natural things. Instead, I focus on God through a few things. Thanksgiving, prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit, which is also called speaking in tongues, worship, and scripture. So those are some of the, the key ones for me personally, and I'll just go through those a little bit. So for Thanksgiving, it's actively daily thanking God for his activity in your life and the lives of those who, lo- who you love. So even if I'm having a day where I can't think of anything to be thankful of for me, but wow, look at that cool thing that happened to my friend or my son or this other person that I care deeply about. I have things to give thanks for every day. And being consciously aware of the need to give thanks is important. That brings us back to the heart of God. Again, it glorifies God. Prayer, prayer is just spending time with God. It may look like praying specifically for other people, but that's only just a fraction of your prayer life. Your, your prayer life is spending time with the Lord personally, sharing your heart with him, telling him about you, because you know what? He knows every hair on your head, but he wants you to share your heart as if he doesn't. He wants to get to know you so that he can open up his heart to you and show you himself, who he is. Ask him questions. That's another really good one. That's fun. You're in the midst of your your prayer time, and you just ask God a question. And then you wait. And you see what he says. Or if he gives you a picture, if he speaks something to you, gives you a word. So prayer language, speaking in tongues. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit here. And... I know I need to give a couple of scriptures for this because I know that not everyone believes in that. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 5. 1 Corinthians 14 is is the chapter that uh, talks a lot about prophesying. And Paul says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. So we've got two really important things here, speaking in tongues and prophesying. And the the fun thing about these two is that they're connected because speaking in tongues is edifying yourself through the Holy Spirit and faith. You got to have faith to speak in tongues. You have faith. If If you speak in tongues, you have faith. And prophesying, prophesying is edification of those around us. It's edification of the body, edification of the church. So we're encouraging and edifying ourselves, praying in the Holy Spirit. We're encouraging and edifying the church by prophesying. So they actually really go well together. And he says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. Jude 20 says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith 
praying in the Holy Spirit. So again, he's talking about that prayer language. He's talking about allowing the Lord to pray through you because I don't, I don't have all the words I need to pray what I need to pray from God. I have the Spirit of the living God inside of me, so I don't necessarily have to have the words if I'm praying in the Spirit. He prays for me. He knows what I need. He knows what needs to be prayed for. That's powerful. So number four, worship, is focusing on and expressing your adoration for God. It's not just singing a song. It's me, just my heart all in, just focusing and worshiping God, my adoration for God, expressing to God my love for him and my gratefulness for what he's done for me through the cross. And then scripture, reading scripture. You can read it. You can listen to it. Soak your mind in the word of God. I may have a fraction of time in my prayer time, in my time with the Lord each day, to read scripture, no matter how much I want to. Everybody has a limit, whether it's 10 minutes or two hours. One thing I've found is with the new Bible apps today, hey, when you're folding laundry, turn on the Bible, stop, let it let it play, let it look, because you know what? That's not studying the Word of God, but it's soaking your mind in the Word of God, and that can that gets inside of you. Yeah, yeah. So we're created to bring kingdom hope, and you know what? Here is a really easy place to start. Here is a safe place. Here is a place where we can encourage each other, where we can, whether we're practiced and have been doing it forever or have never tried to receive, or I've never received a word from the Lord for anybody before, here is a safe place to do that. Okay? Um, what I would like you to do right now is, if you're comfortable with this, please find a partner. Um, it can be someone you know. I'm not going to make any restrictions on this. But I want you guys just to take just one minute to pray for each other. I want you to, you don't have to, I mean, you can lay a hand on the shoulder if they're comfortable with that, but you don't have to. You can just sit next to them and just ask for a word from the Lord. Just say, Lord, how, how do you want me to encourage Susie today? And then you see, does he speak a word to me? I got a word like frog once. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. But then when I shared it, they were like, I know what that means. I'm like, oh, I'm glad you don't, because that's just not, that's just weird to me. So you don't have to, you don't feel discouraged if you don't see or hear something. God speaks to us in different ways, and you got to practice hearing from the Lord. You hear from God. You have the spirit of the living God inside of you. You hear from him. You do. So why don't we just take one minute, and then we're going to go into a time of public ministry. So if you feel like you need more personal private ministry, we're just going to have a couple people over here in the corner prepared and ready for you to pray with you. Okay? And after that, if you're ready, you can just enjoy the rest of your beautiful Sunday, as my husband loves to say. God is with you here, and he'll be with you when you leave, too. All right. Thanks, guys. Have an awesome day.